Welcome to Unit 8, Topic 8.7, Global Resistance to Establish Power Structures After 1900. So this is about different forms of resistance to power that's been established in early modern to the modern world. All right, let's take a look. So by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to explain the various reactions to existing power structures in the period after 1900. We're going to make historical connections between historical developments. We're also going to perform our, our analysis and claim construction. Let's get into it. So the historical developments, when we zoom in, first off, the theme focus is cultural developments. All right. Um, and our <coughs> historical developments, responses to existing power structures in the period after 1900 that intensified conflict. Well, that was Augusto Pinochet in Chile, Francisco Franco in Spain, Idi Amin in Uganda, the buildup of the military industrial complex and weapons trading globally by superpowers. You need to understand that, right? So Augusto Pinochet, Francisco, uh, Francisco Franco, Idi Amin, these were like military leaders, okay? That used military power. Okay. Now you also have nonviolent groups that challenged many uh, uh, power structures this century. You've got Gandhi, you've got Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, among others. They promoted peace and nonviolence as a way to bring about political, political, political change. All right. Some movements used violence against civilians, innocent people, in an effort to achieve political aims some of those well the shining path and al-qaeda and this uh established the age of terrorism all right so let's take a look you want to talk about drama people modern day drama let's look at the major developments of the 20th century world war one great depression world war ii large-scale genocides armenia and the holocaust among others the rise of fascism and communism the cold war decolonization globalization well this is what we're looking at how did large scale groups, smaller groups and individuals respond to all this drama and conflict? These are the responses of militarized states and they intensified conflict. First, we have to understand what the military industrial complex is. So many superpowers, they built up their strong militaries to defend themselves. And like the two superpowers, best examples, USSR and, US, and the USA, the arms race, right? Um, many didn't have factories to produce their own weapons. So they started this global international weapons trade. All right. It expanded globally. So now, uh, states and groups that were not superpowers, they became the middlemen in this trade group and they got their hands on all kinds of weapons. Okay. They became weaponized. So the connection between government defense and private businesses who built those weapons increased exponentially and that is the military industrial complex privatization of military weapons and selling them to the government and selling them to different governments all around the world this is a way that extremist groups can get their hands on these weapons if these private uh institutions these private businesses illegally sell them to these groups to make money right and that causes conflict look at military spenders Top 10 in 2019, look at the United States of America compared to the rest of the world. You can almost fit the, the, the spending on military of all the other nine into the United States is spending. Look at that, right? We're talking about the military industrial complex, military spending and exchange to create defense or use for aggression. The response of military states, states let's talk about Spain. Francisco Franco, all the way 1939 to 1975. He overthrew a popularly elected government. He was str uh, strongly anti-communist, became an ally of the U.S. Political dissenters were executed in prisons, sent to labor camps. This guy was a totalitarian leader. And after his death, Spain moved to more towards a democracy. And you're going to see a smaller group that reacted to this. Now you have Idi Amin in Uganda. He was a military dictator who ruled Uganda all the way to 1979. They called him the butcher of Uganda. This was a bad man. 
All right. He was backed by the USSR in East Germany. He declared himself the president for life. He denied basic human rights. He undermined economic stability. He expelled 60,000 Asians, 500,000 deaths, all purposely targeted by this man. You have Augusto Pinochet in Chile, and he was a dictator all the way to 1990. He attempted to reverse any progressive land reform policies. All right. He killed thousands of political opponents and human. He was uh, guilty of uh, uh, countless human rights crimes. Uh, now let's take a look of militarized groups and individuals that actually challenge larger power structures in the period after 1900. We have Che Guevara. He was anti-imperialist. He was Marxist philosophy. He was all about using guerrilla warfare to undermine democratically run governments. All right. <clears throat> he was a Marxist revolutionary. He was actually a doctor. He was a major figure in the Cuban revolution. He traveled all through Latin America uh, uh, and he proliferated that Marxist philosophy. But with Cuba in 1956, about 82 revolutionaries, including Chi and Castro, they landed in Cuba and they wound up overthrowing a U.S. backed government. Uh, the Batista regime. All right. So here's a smaller group that's overthrowing a larger power structure. Let's take a look at a different example, nonviolent groups and individuals that challenged power structures. You know them. You have Mohandas Gandhi, right? With his marches, his boycotts, his fasts. You got MLK Jr., right? With his nonviolent civil disobedience and resistance um brown versus the board of education they banned racial segregation of schools the boycott of public buses in alabama that ended segregation the massive marches like the famous one in washington and all the civil rights and finally of nelson mandela right to end apartheid right a lot of protests and these are three perfect examples of non-violence resistance let's look at movements that used violence against civilians in an effort to achieve political aims. We're talking about the age of terrorism, people. You're talking about in North Ireland, you're talking about the IRA. And this is about where Catholics were the majority, uh, but many in Northern Ireland uh, were Protestants. And this is major, major clashes. They gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1922, but Northern Ireland remained part of the U UK and Northern Ireland Catholics, they did suffer major discrimination, okay? And this was major, uh, the tensions are still there, okay? Let's talk about the age of terrorism, separatists in Spain. You have the Basque Homeland and Freedom Front. They're called the ETA. Look where they are located in the northeastern region on the border between France and Spain. And, and they blended both cultures between France and Spain, created their own over time identity. And then they adopted uh, Marxist views and they wanted their own independent nation. And they decided to terrorize Spain in order to get it. They killed more than 800 people. And after Francisco Franco died, they attempted to overthrow the new democratic leader of Spain as Spain was moving toward more of a democracy. Lasted all the way up to about 2011. <clears throat> they still exist, but right now there's a ceasefire. We're talking about Peru's shining path. Well, this was organized by a professor uh, Abimel Guzman, he was a revolutionary leader um, based on the ideas of Mao Zedong and Cambodia's Khmer Rouge, right? How, oh my goodness, how good is this guy? Um, so this is decades of bombings and assassinations to overthrow the existing uh, democratic government, replace it with a communist one. I mean, this is 20 years of terrorism by the, by the shining path, right? Over 37,000 deaths. All right. So now to 2011, the top leader began negotiations with proving government for peace. Finally, we have Islamic terrorism, the fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. These are extremists. This is not the common Arab Muslim interpretation uh, of their cultural faith. These are extremists who uh, bend uh, the common interpretation to their will to more of a political and war based aims. Um, we got Boko Haram in West Africa. You have um, Al-Shabaab in East Africa. You've had ISIL in the Middle East, the Taliban in Afghanistan, 
and ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, which you should be familiar with. Here is your prompt. To what extent was the various reactions to existing power structures in the period after 1900 fueled by cultural conflict? I'm going to give you 15 minutes. I want you to look at the images that follow. Put any notes down you would like. Choose above the options I give you inside the box. You'll see there will be options you want to choose. The force that's strongest. You have 15 minutes. Go. Here we go. Prompt. To what extent, to what degree, were the various reactions to existing power structures that we looked at previously in the period after 1900 fueled by cultural conflict? When we're talking about culture, we're talking primarily about religion and tradition. Okay? So was cultural conflict the strongest force? Right? That's what we're looking at in the way people reacted to the power structures. So if they ever mention social, political, environmental, economic, cultural, if they mention one of those, they're asking you to compare all. To what extent, so to what degree was cultural the most powerful out of all of them? To what degree? Let's take a look. Here's how I reason this. I look at the image and it says apartheid. Students again, apartheid. What is apartheid? That's, that is, wait a second. Students against apartheid. Well, oh, free South Africa. Is this South Africa? No, this is a Texas A&M University in America. Okay, so why do they care? Well, let's look. I called this political and cultural. Political, why? It's a reaction to South African domestic policy based on race. So this is a reaction to South African political policy to separate people according to color, right? But it's also cultural because it's a reaction to hundreds of years of racism. They want to end racism. But why doesn't it say students against racism? It says students against apartheid. Apartheid is a political policy in South Africa. So it can be both. But out of these, out of the two, which one is more powerful? I say political because evidence in the image says apartheid, not to end racism. They're reacting to a political policy. See that? Let's take a look at image two. We're talking about the Basque homeland and liberty front, right? What did they want? Their own country. How are they going to get it? By terrorizing Spain until they could get it. And then they find out Spain is turning democratic and they want to terrorize it even more. What is this? This is a political reaction to Spain's political transition to democracy. This is a direct political reaction to Spain's transition of the government structure. All right. Document three. Oh, this is Gandhi salt march demonstration. This is a political reaction to British foreign policy. This is a political reaction to imperialism, British colonial rule in India. Gandhi is directly <coughs> protesting British rule in India. This is political reaction. The salt march is a direct political reaction to established power at that time to imperialism. Document four, we get Che Guevara. This is a political reaction to Cuba's political structure. He wants to help overthrow a U.S. backed governmental regime in Cuba and install Fidel Castro. This is a political reaction. This is anti-capitalism, anti-democracy. He's a Marxist. He wants to infuse those ideas into a new government in Cuba. Political reaction. Oh, wow. Look at this right here. Here's the big one, right? So this is to end racism, right? End racism. It's all about culture and racism. Look at the signs they're holding. End segregated rules. What are segregated rules? Those are Jim Crow laws. That's political legislation. We demand voting rights. That's political legislation. 
right? So what is this? This is political and culture. It's a reaction to U.S. domestic policy, the Jim Crow laws. And it's also cultural because it's an end to racism. But do any of those signs say end racism? It's surprising. They're reacting to political legislation in America. So it is both, but out of these two, what's more powerful? I would say political because the evidence on the signs proves it. All right, now you have Al-Qaeda and 9-11. So what is this? Both political and cultural. It's political because it's a reaction to U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East with helping support Great Britain and France mandate system after World War I. Remember the Sykes-Picot Agreement, redrawing the political boundaries and pushing Shia and Sunni groups up against each other, causes conflict, which bleeds into cultural, the religious, religious reactions to influence of Western capitalism. So which one is stronger here? You can choose. Right. You can make a strong argument that either one is stronger. OK. You can also talk about economics here, too, because of America's economic interests in the Middle East. And it led to the political uh, uh, legislation. Finally, you have the shining path. And that's definitely political because it's a political reaction of Peru's government structure. They want to overthrow it. All right. And implement the ideas of Mao Zedong and the Khmer Rouge. So that's political. So now when you look at all this, I say political to a great extent because documents one and seven all reveal political reactions evidenced by little images inside each image, right? Little pieces of evidence. And then I say cultural is to a lesser extent because documents one, five, and six definitely show cultural, but there's much more political, seven documents that are political. And then I make this up. In the period after 1900, politics can be seen as the strongest force that fueled the various reactions to existing power structures, while cultural conflict played a lesser role. Prove it, Mr. D. Well, the reason for this is because documents one through seven all similarly reveal reactions to foreign and domestic state policies legislation, while documents one, five, and six show an undercurrent of racial and religious tensions. Okay, what to take away? This is what you need to remember. Although conflict dominated much of the 20th century, many individuals and groups, including states, opposed this trend. Some individuals and groups, however, intensified those conflicts as we saw today. So also, when it comes to analysis, when performing image analysis, always ask yourself, if you look at one image, how does this image reflect the essay prompt? Go back and briefly scan all the objects you see, the actions, what's going on, the messages in the image, and bounce it back once again. How does this image reflect the essay prompt? Then use that reflection to help group your documents in preparation for claim construction. I hope this helps.